Hello everybody, it's Adrian Plus here. And Bridget. We are both here again. And, <laughs> we um, are. Before we go any further, um, I know people are probably getting bored out of their minds with our jigsaw, um, which uh, we are still battling with. But in case you think we've been exaggerating it, this Monet painting that has been made into a jigsaw, the, the difficulty of it, um, if you look on the website, you will see a photograph of it uh, in its shameful glory. <laughs> and you'll see just how far we've got. But we're not giving up. We're going on. We're going on. And we had an amazing response to uh, the the things we were saying about the colours of the days in the week. And it turns out that loads of people have something very similar, but it's not all colours. Some are. Um, uh, one person, rather strangely, I thought <laughs> when I first I think, yeah. read it, said that she, she allocates a house to each day. I, I don't even know quite what that means, but... <laughs> That's that's that person's way, um, and somebody else thinks thinks in terms of shape. So, for instance, Sunday is a very tall day, yeah. and interestingly, one person said that um, she was so certain of the colours of the days of the week when she was a child that when she grew up and she had a child herself, she was stunned and amazed that her daughter mm -hmm. didn't agree with her <laughs> about the colors of the days so um for her it was it was almost engraved on her mind it was. um those those colors it was and one of her colors was that tuesday was yellow because it was brownies oh no sorry i think uh yeah no it was orange because it was brownies that night which I thought was really nice, a hopeful, exciting day because something nice. And equally, somebody said that from her childhood, Wednesday was a horrible sludgy green because she hated Wednesdays. The reason she did was because she was born on a Wednesday and Wednesday's child is full of woe. But I think our favourite this week came from somebody who we've actually known since she was about 14 and we knew her gran as well. And she was talking about the days of the week as being precious stones, wasn't she? she and it was, was yeah. just lovely. So I'll just give you one or two of them. I hope I pronounced them right. Tuesday was orange, not because of brownies, but it's an orange carnelian, which she says is a red orange stone. And it's such a lovely, smiley, encouraging, bright stone. And the reason she loves that is because she's a support worker and she goes to a community centre that day. And from her colleagues and from her clients, she gets so much love and smiliness and encouragement. Then we've got Friday. Now that's interesting because her favourite stone is a tiger eye, which is brown. But what she said is the more you look at it, the is that a kind you go, of gem then? A it is. Tiger. A yeah, tiger eye, yeah. yeah. The more you go into it, the more <clears throat> beautiful it becomes. Oh, wow. I know. And I think my favourite of all is Sunday is a polished kyanite blue crystal. And she said it doesn't look all that much, but when you polish it, it's as clear as a summer sky. I just thought those were beautiful. I think we might get that pronunciation checked later. <laughs> kyanite. Kyanite. I'm going to say kyanite <laughs> with confidence. And somebody else thought that Sunday was crystal-like, sparkling white. I just keep them coming. We're loving them. We're in Jerusalem, as we said we were going to be all this week. And we were thinking about how crowded Jerusalem would be, absolutely bustling, so many people coming up to celebrate the Passover and how odd that is for us this year because usually at Easter the supermarkets are crowded with people worrying that the Easter eggs are running out on the shelves and they're going to end up with some ghastly boring egg that nobody's really going to want in large cardboard packaging that nobody's going to want afterwards and so on and so on. But the thing about Passover is that it's celebrated by the Jews every year. It's the highlight of their year. It is to celebrate a time that represents escape from exile. And of course, in a way, Jews know a lot about exile. 
we're now experiencing a little bit about exile. And you once met somebody, didn't you, who understood that more than most? Well, it was a friend of ours, actually called Hugo Green. <clears throat> and some of you may remember him. He was a, a reform rabbi and also quite a well-known broadcaster. And I had the opportunity uh, one day to go and see him and ask him about his experiences in Auschwitz. He went to Auschwitz when he was a young teenager uh, and he was there with his father and traveled through the camps with his father from that time onwards. And there was one thing he said to me that um, brought tears to my eyes and uh, I think um, showed us the value of one particular quality which you'll hear about in a moment for those in exile. Yes, I have my father with me, and it was really because of him that I managed to avoid the, the excesses that many other prisoners were driven to. He was a very sane, very intelligent, very good man, and he kept me from doing really bizarre or shameful things. I don't mean I was particularly good, I just had that peculiar dimension of luck in having him with me. I'll tell you why. He kept hope alive. I remember he once saved the margarine ration for weeks, and he made a little bowl out of clay mm. and a wick from strands of cloth, just so that he could light a candle to celebrate the festival of Hanukkah. One way or another, he said, we are going to celebrate. And he got all the people together to light the menorah, and I asked Hugo, did you understand why he did that? And Hugo threw his hands out and said, no, I thought it was a waste of margarine. I said so, especially as the candle didn't even light when it came to it. It just sputtered and died. But my father took me on one side. I was about 13 then. And he said, Hugo, understand this. We'd been through a lot. A forced march, with no food and for a couple of days no water. You can live without food for a while, but you can't live long without water. But I am telling you, my son, that you cannot live for three minutes in this place without hope. You've got to have hope. Mm. And he was right. Mm. Hope. You know, one of the things that uh, is said during the Seder meal, the Passover meal, is next year in Jerusalem. And I think that we need to be saying during these days of Easter, next year, all together again. Family around the table, if we have family, chance to go out and be part of the crowd in the supermarkets. Just normality will return. And it's, I think it's really important to think about the small things that may not appear as if they mean much, but to continue with little things that are about hope and about love and about looking after people and all those good things. We must really value them. When the meal happened in the upper room with Jesus and the disciples, we don't know exactly what happened apart from what's recorded in the Bible. But we can imagine, and I imagined that there was a woman there who discovered on that day, on the day of the Last Supper, that it was possible to learn something very important about small things. I once asked my wise father, will I see change in my life? Well, daughter, he replied, one day, you may live in a different village and perhaps your task in life will alter. So the things you see and hear and touch are new and unfamiliar. And that is one kind of change. But there's also a change of mind and spirit. And when that happens, even the most ordinary, familiar and unvarying things of life can be transfigured. Well, my father's answer stayed in my heart, but I didn't understand it. Not until today. 
You see, I provide clean, dry towels for the guests at my master's house. Well, today, the travelling teacher named Jesus arrived with his followers to celebrate the Passover in our upper room. Well, imagine my amazement when after they'd eaten, the man called Jesus filled a bowl with water, knelt on the floor and began to wash the feet of his own followers. A rabbi washing feet can a thing be impossible and also possible. I did not believe so until now. Almost immediately a disagreement broke out, the largest of the disciples beating the air with his finger and declaring something in a loud voice. There was a quiet reply from the rabbi and then the big man seemed to be begging Jesus in equally passionate tones to perform a service for him. Well, after that the washing continued and, finding that the cloth he'd placed round his waist was very quickly sodden, the master turned and beckoned to me to bring dry towels. I helped him. I helped Jesus. Side by side on our knees we made a way from man to man and after washing the feet of each one with great thoroughness and care, he would turn to me for a towel to be placed across his outstretched hands. And when the task was completed, he smiled at me and he said, thank you. You and I, we work well together, don't we? I could have stayed on my knees beside Jesus forever. Father was right. My work is different. Those I serve are different. Even the simple towel that hangs over my arm is different. I helped Jesus. We worked well together. Everything has changed. And of course, everything did change after that. It's very, very hard, isn't it, to imagine what it was like for Jesus, knowing that this was the last time he would ever celebrate the Passover he celebrated since he was a boy with his friends and that they still would not understand the pain that he must have felt when he saw Judas leave the room. The pain he then felt in Gethsemane when his friends fell asleep and he was on his own and alone in a way that he had never been before. But he wasn't the only one who felt alone that night. He wasn't the only one who felt that things had become dark and that there was very little hope for life and brightness ever to come back again into his life. There was someone else, someone we know very well, somebody called Peter. Why was I weeping? It was him. It was his fault. Stupid Jesus. He didn't want me. He didn't need me. He talked to me sometimes as if I was some dark, terrible person, a fiend, trying to drag him away from his blessed, blasted pathway to whatever horrible thing he's convinced has to happen to him. He called me Satan once. Me. Me. I mean, he needs to sort his ideas out. I can't be the rock he's going to build his church on and Satan as well. Can I? You tell me. Well, perhaps I can. Perhaps I'm thick. The thing is, you're supposed to help your friends, aren't you? And I would have done. I'm not saying I wasn't scared, but when they came for him in the garden, I got my sword out, and I honestly think I would have died for him on the spot if I had to. Do you know what I mean? It was worth getting cut to pieces for that man, because I loved him. And that's what you do when you love someone, isn't it? You use everything you've got, and you don't... Think about the consequences. You just get in there and you do it. And what did he say? Put your sword away. If I wanted, I could ask my father. He'd send 12 legions of angels to get me out of here. Well, why didn't he? Why not? What was his silly problem? Some kind of lunatic, wild independence. Doesn't need me. Doesn't need my sword. Doesn't need his father's angels. Doesn't need any damn thing except this ghastly black thing that has to happen for reasons that only he understands. Well, what is he on about? What is he on about? 
Why did I say I didn't know him? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I do know. I was embarrassed about people thinking I was tied up with this loser. I was hurt. He didn't need me. Not me. Not the me that would have done anything for him apart from trailing along behind this dark, hopeless, pointless misery. Oh, dear God, I wish he hadn't looked at me. I love him. And I'm so, so sorry. And I would give anything, anything to have another chance. But it isn't going to happen. I know it isn't. I've blown it. It isn't going to happen. You can't live without hope. But we know the end of the story. Peter was going to discover the end of the story. Hugo Green was going to discover that hanging on to hope would get him through the camps and out at the other end. Hope, the essence of all good things. And it was going to come again. <laughs>